Dear colleagues, uh, we start with the today event. Happy New Year and welcome to this webinar which tries to deal with intramural echogenic figures. I think that this topic and the previous one, the nodule echogenicity, clearly emerges from other nodule characteristics. I hope that you will be convinced after this live event. As a warm-up, we start with a poll. I noticed that everyone is muted, so if someone has any questions, please unmute yourself. So, the polling... Okay, I ask uh, somebody to reply me whether I, you can hear me. Please unmute first yourself. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll share my content. I will play the video three times and thereafter you will have around about 30 seconds to reply the poll. Okay, now for the second time. And now for the third time. Okay, you have 40 seconds remained. Okay, so the distribution of answers were as follows. Regarding the first question, five colleagues was in the opinion that the nodule has comet tail artifacts, six that the nodule had back wall figures, seven stated that the nodule had microclassifications, while eleven answers stated that the nodule has macro classifications. 
Six of the colleagues stated that the module clearly has micro classifications, while uh, 11 colleagues replied the question that the module has no unequivocal forms of micro classification. So let's see the case. If anybody wants to comment the case, please do not hesitate, but first unmute yourself. So there is no doubt that the nodule must contain macro classification based on this acoustic shadowing. The issue is the interpretation of these bright echogenic spots. Are these micro classifications or comet tail artifacts or other forms? If we consider the final diagnosis, the lesion proved to be a papillary cancer. Uh, we are in a quite an easy situation. So uh, it is very likely that this uh, nodule had microclassifications. The issue is how to differentiate these forms from comet tail artifacts. Some figures uh, resemble microclassifications, for example, that one, but in the typical form of uh, comet tail artifact within a solid part, uh, it has a <clears throat> A clearly linear uh, reverberating artifact, not in oblique section. So if someone uh, saw that this can be had as a form of cometal artifact, uh, it was not a right uh, decision. This is again quite a suspicious form being a cometal artifact, uh, but not a clear form. The real issue is whether we can st uh, state that the nodule clearly has microclassifications. I don't think that the answer would be obvious. Uh, in my opinion, these figures uh, can be had as unequivocal forms of microclassifications, but others may have on other opinion. I don't think that this nodule would contain backwall figures, no tiny linear forms, except for here, but maybe I was wrong. Here, that, that form, yes, yes, this is a backwall figure, okay, I corrected myself. So here, this is a linear form, dorsal to deeply or unechoic, tiny cystic era. So, Course classification present, backflow figure present. The issue is the interpretation of these echogenic spots. And we will deal with this problem during this lesson. Any comments, suggestions to this case? Are you here? Yes. 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 Okay. If no comments, I uh, will go forward and share again my content. So, in the upcoming four live webinars, we will discuss the ultrasound characteristics of thyroid nodules, except for nodule echogenicity and composition, which were the topics of the previous webinar three weeks ago. Before turning to the discussion of these features, it seems worthwhile to analyze the topics to be discussed from a slightly broader perspective. I ask you to use the lessons of this table to filter the things that will be said in the coming weeks. These lessons not only seem to be disturbing, but are really thought-provoking. In the next two or three minutes, I will deliberately provoke the audience. 
The third thing is whether should it be accepted that compared to the previous era, when cytology was performed from all nodules, we should give up the cytological examination. It has to give up the chance of detecting cancer in a non-negligible part of the cases. Do we have to accept that we give up the detection of one of every six thyroid cancers? Do we really have well-established scientific data on this issue? By the end of 2022, I'm aware of a total of two out of the 10,000 publications dealing with thyroids, which raised doubts about the system usability. So the question is, do we have data on comparison of the benefits thyroids saves cytological examination in about 35% and the cause that more than 15% of thyroid cancers are not recognized? I won't answer my question, but I ask everybody to try to think through the possible answers in the coming weeks. There's a second problem or a second layer of this issue, which leads us closer to the today topic. And this layer reveals a similarly disturbing and thought-provoking situation. Why to spend time with the analysis and judgment of ultrasound characteristics other than echogenicity? Does it really have any advantages for the management of patients and for the interest of patients? We can see that the overall output of judgment based on a single ultrasound feature nodule hypochogenicity is essentially the same if we compare that to the judgment based on analysis of echogenicity plus other suspicious characteristics. In addition to, regarding the diagnosis of more aggressive forms of thyroid cancers, the taking into account signs other than echogenicity clearly worsens the diagnostic sensitivity primarily of follicular cancers. In advance, I can say that everyone has to answer the first question, it is how the disadvantages and advantages arising from the application of thyroid systems compare to each other. But regarding the second problem, that one, the comparison of decision based on thyroid or based on uh, only hypochogenicity, uh, whether it makes sense, hopefully we will get a relatively clear answer by the end of today's webinar. Now turn to the today topic. In the presentation, I highlight some important aspects of the team, and in the meantime, we jointly analyze these 14 cases partly presented in advance on the website. Although I give a brief overview of the topic, essentially emphasize some important issues, this cannot replace the viewing of the pre-recorded lecture and the manual presented on the website. This table includes all possible forms of intramural echogenic figures. Some are very common and we meet them in every patient. This is the normal connective tissue backbone of the thyroid and the thyroid nodules. There are two forms of echogenic figures which are related to cystic degeneration and we meet them in more than 50% of thyroid nodules. These are the cometal artifacts and backwell cystic figures. The microclassification is the public enemy. The macro classification or coarse classification is relatively easy to recognize. The last two forms are special and rarely occurring patterns. I will present several cases of them. Let's see a single table which presents four cases of medullary cancers. All cases occur in hypochic nodules, which is not a coincidence because hypochogenicity is the most frequent ultrasound characteristics of medullary cancer with more than 90% sensitivity. But this time, let's focus on the echonormal patches which contain bright echogenic spots. This pattern, marked with yellow arrows, corresponds to amyloid deposit and is found in around 50% of medullary cancers. The size of the echonormal patch ranges from several millimeters to even several centimeters, as demonstrated by smaller structures signed with yellow arrow. Occasionally, 
this hyperechoic patchy figure can extend to much greater part of the tumor, see the right lower image. Almost in the entire robe we can see this hyperechoic background with uh, more bright echogenic spots. Due to the rarity of the disease, it is difficult to assess its diagnostic value, but is really an important pattern. In Hungary, regular calcitonin measurement is not justified, not even in hypochagic nodules. Uh, I perform calcitonin tests naturally in patients in whom the cytology raises the suspicion of medullary cancer, and also in most cases of cytologically suspected or diagnosed oxyphilic tumors. These two tumors, oxyphilic tumors and medullary cancers, have similar cytological pattern and can be confused and are really confused not infrequently. And last but not least, I perform calcitonin measurement if I am faced with this ultrasound pattern. So, echonormal background within a hypochoric module which contains bright echogenic foci. So, this is the typical presentation of amyloid deposit. Again, a single table of granulomas. Naturally, the role of patient's history is crucial. These granules occur only in operated patients. Otherwise, this pattern can be very concerning. A very hard, irregularly shaped hypercake mass would raise the suspicion of papillary cancer. As a rule, granulation always lacks vascularity. So, irregular, shaped, bright echogenic foci, very hard on palpation, always a vascular, we have to be aware of patient history not to mix up this granule with papillary cancer. So let's focus on the real issue, the microcalcifications. Indeed, three other kinds of echogenic figures can present in the form of echogenic spots. These are the connective tissue, the back wall figures and the comet tail artifacts. Now see one of the cases presented in advance. Okay, before I share my content, I start another pool. Okay, and share my content. Case 15, is it? Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes. yes. So again, I will present the video three times. The issue is this module and the intranodular figures within. And now for the last time.
Okay. You have 30 seconds left to reply the poll. Okay, so I share once more the content and while playing the video I tell you the distribution of answers. So Comet Tail Artifacts 0, Backworld Figures 5, Micro Classifications 15, No Macro Classifications and 12 colleagues stated that the nodule has proliferation of connective tissue. Does anybody wish to comment this case or present? No one? Okay. Then I will make my duty. So first, here is the nodule and very tiny cystic areas. The nodule is practically almost completely solid. It uh, does not exclude fully the possibility that this has tiny cystic areas, but this is not a usual nodule with cystic degenerations. The second consideration. Okay, here we see anechoic parts and dorsal to this echogenic lines, but be aware that more of the echogenic granules are lines and not granules. Here is a granule, here is another, here is another, but most of the, not most, but prevailing parts of the echogenic figures are lines. So there are two intranural echogenic figures, two kinds, which present uh, together lines and granules. These are backward figures and proliferation of connective tissue. A third consideration. The echogenic figures are distributed equally. This is quite a regular pattern. So in the event of microclassifications, uh, uh, we cannot see this uh, quite regular distribution of echogenic figures. I guess that the most important uh, thing is the coincidence, the coexistence of echogenic lines and granules, and uh, this clearly stands for either backfall figures or microclassifications. Regarding the second question, whether are there microclassifications, unequivocal forms of microclassifications, 13 colleagues stated that there are unequivocal forms while 16 uh, was on the other opinion. Uh, I uh, warn you, if you meet such pattern, not to take side whether these are clear forms of microclassifications. Naturally, cytology is clearly indicated, uh, but these forms, I cannot exclude the possibility that one or another forms cannot be microclassifications but the entire pattern stands for proliferation of connective tissue or back wall figures. So I can accept if someone raises the possibility that these granules are partly microclassifications or cannot exclude the possibility, but these are not obvious forms of microclassifications. So once more, coexistent lines and granules and regular distribution of these echogenic figures. This nodule proved to be a follicular adenoma on histopathology. Comments, questions regarding this case?
Are you convinced that my explanation was good, right or not? Okay. Could, you please. Could be yes, different be, between uh, follicular adenoma and carcinoma in uh, in the pattern of uh, ultrasound pattern. I I don't think that we have any clue. Okay. So, so uh, the nodule had uh, perinodular vascularity. It was a solitary large nodule. This stand for follicular tumor, whether it being the benign or malignant counterpart. So this. Uh, Mm. You never know. Mm -hmm. So this uh, vascular pattern uh, is uh, clearly proves that this uh, has a halo and mm -hmm. uh, is surrounded with capsule, but no clue. So microclassification, mm -hmm. as uh, it will be discussed later in this uh, webinar, uh, is the presentation of microclassification. Uh, a tip of the calcified papilla or psammoma body and the only mm -hmm. histopathological entity which contains uh, psammoma body is the papillary cancer. Okay. Okay, other yeah. comments, questions? If not, try to memorize this pattern this quite regular distribution, it is not a frequent finding. So uh, a nodule with such an extensive fibrotic changes is an exception. Okay, we go forward with the PowerPoint presentation. So, as we have seen, proliferation of connective tissue can cause concern but the previously presented concerning pattern occurs very rarely. In the everyday practice, the two cystic related forms can be misinterpreted and indeed are not infrequently misinterpreted as microclassifications. If these figures do not behave lazy, then their recognition is not a great problem. A comet tail artifact with the characteristic fading tail in a cystic fluid should not be mixed up with microclassifications. The issue is caused by colloid crystals without tail in seemingly solid areas. It can happen after the removal or spontaneous absorption of cystic fluid. Now let's see two more examples. So we can see many cystic areas within the thyroid. I don't ask you what are these because there are uh, very typical forms of comet tail artifacts. So these intranular equigenic granules should not be mixed up with other uh, forms of intranular equigenic figures. I try to find here a single form. Not here. So this is a reverberating artifact. Here is the primary focus, the colloid crystal, and here is a dorsal narrowing tail. I will present some uh, enlarged cases, cases with enlargement, uh, but uh, usually we do that. Here is another typical form. Colloid crystal with a cystic fluid and the dorsal fading and narrowing tail with a quite triangular form. So this is the typical presentation of comet tail artifact. Any comments or questions regarding this case? No. Okay. If not, I present a second case. This part of the video will be played in another time. This nodule in the right lobe. So I ask you to focus on the nodule in the isthmus or in the left side of the isthmus. 
What are these echogenic figures within this module? Proliferation of connective tissue? Yes, it's very similar to that, but uh, they are located dorsal, mostly dorsal to cystic areas. But uh, it is essentially the same presentation, uh, connective tissue and uh, back of the figure. Yes, uh, but uh, it, I, I don't think that this would be a great problem uh, if uh, someone says that this is, for example, uh, corresponds to connective tissue because here is no cystic area. Here, before this uh, line, we can see tiny cystic areas. Here we can guess, here is clearly, but uh, regarding that, and this line, we cannot see cystic areas. It is not a problem. The issue is not to mix up these forms with microcalcifications. So again, the coexistence of lines and granules. Here is, for example, a granule. Here is a faded granule. Here is this part of this line is bright, seemingly a spot but the coexistence of lines and granules uh, are the hallmark of connective tissue and also the hallmark of the more frequent form, the backward cystic ones. In that nodule here in the right side, not, not this, here it, it also has uh, backward cystic figures. So I think that this is quite an easy case, easy to interpret case. Other comments or questions regarding this case? Okay, so these were quite obvious forms of uh, comet tail artifacts and the latter case of backward cystic figures. So, so the other cystic uh, related figure is the back wall figure. Uh, these are always found dorsal to cystic, not infrequently very tiny cystic areas. The hallmark, as I mentioned, is the co-occurrence of echogenic lines and granules. If the latter prevails, plus we overlook the ventral cystic areas, then it can lead to misinterpretation of these figures as microcalcifications. We must realize that in contrast with the above discussed two cystic related forms and the connective tissue, which have at least in part of the cases a characteristic presentation, diagnosing a, a microcalcification is the matter of exclusion. Okay, we all know that microcalcification is a round, bright, echogenic granule smaller than one millimeter in maximal diameter. However, such granules can be presentations of connective tissue or comet tail artifact without the characteristic tail and granular forms of backward figures. So granulation that looks like a microcalcification is not diagnostic by itself. One more very important consideration. As we will see, the presence of a single typical comet tail artifact within a nodule practically excludes that the nodule would be malignant. On the other hand, the presence of backward figures does not modify the malignancy rate. This table presents a meta-analysis. Although we can see that the ratio of microcalcifications diagnosed on ultrasound is much, much higher in papillary cancers than in benign lesions, but indeed, if we describe this on ultrasound, the chance of a benign lesion exceeds that of papillary cancer. See the last row. 510 versus 492. This is due to the much higher occurrence of benign nodules. What does it mean for our everyday practice? The positive predictive value of clear forms of microcalcifications is around 50% which indeed ranges from 10 to 80% depending on the inter-observer variability in judgment. I will return to the problem in the last part of the lecture, but first I will present 
how intramural echogenic figures are handled by guidelines and turrets. The details of the five turret systems are discussed in the pre-recorded introductory lecture presented on the website. <clears throat> As this screen uh, demonstrates, we should not memorize the different scoring systems, but it is worth to realize the different concepts behind the different systems. With respect of echogenic figures, several considerations must be made. Three weeks ago, I demonstrated that some guidelines make distinction according to the degree of hypogenicity, while others do not. And this basic difference attaches the handling of all suspicious characteristics, including microclassifications. There is a second very important difference between the guidelines, and this affects the handling of suspicious characteristics. Two guidelines are on the opinion that the presence of a suspicious sign does not necessarily lead to grouping the lesion among the most suspicious category, but the AACE and the European approaches are different. These systems classify nodule which shows any of the suspicious features, including microclassifications, among the worst subgroup. What are the practical consequences of these differences? The first one is that a non hypercritic module cannot be regarded among Tarets 5 lesions in the ATA and Colon systems, but can be regarded in the other two guidelines. The second difference concerns the handling of nodules with suspicious signs. Depending on the echogenicity of such lesions, they can be regarded either as targets 4 or 5 lesions in the first two systems. But irrespectively of their echogenicity, these nodules must be regarded as targets 5 lesions in the other two systems. To clarify these differences, I present two examples. A very hypercrit module without suspicious signs is regarded as a TIRETS 4 in the American Tired Association and Korean guidelines, while it is classified among most suspicious lesions in the AAC and EU TIRETS. The other difference concerns isocircuit nodules with suspicious findings. These are handled as targets for regions in the 4-2 systems, but are regarded as most suspicious nodules in the other two guidelines. It seems evident that apart from other differences, compared to the ATE and current targets, the AACE and EU targets must have better sensitivity, but weaker specificity. I think it's worth to dig a bit deeper for a better understanding. It is very interesting that the same ocean of observations and ten thousands of individual publications are treated differently. I emphasize here only one difference of the approaches. See these four nodules. All are darker than the non-nodular thyroid tissue, so all four are hypochic nodules. The ATA and Corin approach treat all four nodules in the same way and do not make distinction according to the degree of hypogenicity. The reason for this is backed by the observation that there is a very low, occasionally only a by chance agreement among authors regarding the distinction of deeply and non-deeply hypochic nodules. So the authors of the ATA and current guidelines are on the opinion that based on this huge interobserver variation, it would be scientifically unfounded to make distinction according to the degree of hypogenicity. The AAC and European approach focuses on another important aspect, which has been proven since decades. Deeper the hypogenicity, greater the chance of being the nodule malignant. Although these guidelines do not say it literally, but their approach suggests that it would be unacceptable if these four nodules would be handled in the same way. Before moving forward, it seems to be worth clarifying a controversial situation. The term microclassification has different meanings in ultrasound and in histopathology. In reality, 
that is in pathology, microcalcification occurs almost exclusively in the calcified tip of papillary cancer, and the finding of a single psalmoma body is almost diagnostic of papillary cancer in histopathology. In virtuality, that is in ultrasound, we frequently use the term microcalcification for structures which are indeed not microcalcifications, only pretend as if they were. If we, were, if, we were if we were to take the meaning of the words seriously, except for a single professional society, no one guidelines takes this seriously, then the ultrasound diagnosis of microcalcification would be the same as diagnosing a papillary cancer. Now I show again the previously presented meta-analysis with the extension of the reality, that is, the histopathological findings. Indeed, no benign lesions present with psalmoma bodies, while only fourth of papillary cancers has microcalcifications. So, less than half of sonographically diagnosed microcalcifications are indeed microcalcifications. On this background, C.2, the European guidelines suggested that the term microcalcification should be restricted only to unequivocal forms. The other solution is the brand new approach of the American College of Radiologists, which abandoned the use of microcalcification and introduced a new term, punctate echogenic focus. And this category involves microcalcifications and small comet tail artifacts. The latter is defined as a hyperacal granule without the characteristic tail within a solid part. Be aware of this really exciting innovation. The ACR tries to kill two birds with one stone, handing the issue that microcalcification-like spots occur in pathological conditions other than papillary cancer, and the second one, the issue of interpreting and handling those cometary artifacts which can be mixed up with microcalcifications. Unfortunately, of course, there is no magic bullet. Solving one problem usually results in the birth of a new one. In this case, the new problem is that it causes a step back in a sense. With sufficient practice, and thorough analysis, in many cases, we can safely determine that a non-typical appearance cometal artifact is really a cometal artifact. The third consideration concerns the cometal artifact itself. Except for the two well-known kinds of cysts, the pure and spongiform types, which are handled as equivalent of benign condition, most guidelines focus only on features which increase the likelihood of malignancy. The only exception is the Koran guideline, which approach is absolutely unique. It really is as if we have a miracle weapon in certain situation. The Koran guideline, as the only among important ones, is of the opinion that the presence of cometal artifact means that the lesion is benign. It does not state literally, but the current target summary table can be interpreted without further ado as regardless of the presence of any suspicious signs, the presence of a single cometal artifact excludes malignancy. I have to confess that I had some doubts regarding this straightforward statement, but very recently I spent a week reviewing videos of nearly 500 malignant cases in order to find a, even a single exception. But I couldn't find even a single one. So the Koreans have convinced me. We, not, we know long ago that the presence of microcalcifications increases the likelihood of malignancy. Nevertheless, only in statistical but not in practical manner. European and Korean experts are in the opinion that the role of macroclassification is so limited that they do not include any forms into the scoring systems. However, there are some forms of macroclassifications 
which can have some practical relevance, at least two American guidelines are on this opinion. If we merge into the details, most peripheral type calcifications matter. Within this type, the axial or rim calcification emerges. And the last partition, within axial or rim calcifications, those are very suspicious, which present with extrusive soft tissue component. Going deeper and deeper into the subgroups and subgroups of subgroups, the sensitivity weakens significantly while the specificity increases. Finally, it is worth analyzing the approach of the American Thyroid Association. This table summarizes the rules of ATA thyroids. Two very, very important considerations. The first is a seemingly major error that has been mentioned by several experts in the literature. According to the rules of the ATA, it is not possible to categorize isohyperechaic nodules showing suspicious signs. Be aware, intermediate suspicion contains only hyperechaic nodules, high suspicion contains only hyperechaic nodules, and in the low suspicion nodules are isochaic nodules without any suspicious signs. So how to handle isochaic nodules with suspicious signs? I think it's some kind of psychology. It is a Freudian thing. The authors may think that this kind of module, if it exists, doesn't deserve attention. And indeed, less than 5% of nodules belong to this subgroup, and around 2% of cancers occur in such lesions. The second consideration is even more interesting. Although the American Thyroid Association guideline makes distinction among hypochaic nodules on the absence or presence of suspicious characteristics, and the former is regarded as thyroid 4, while the latter is as thyroid 5 lesion. However, it is the only of the thyroid systems that gives the same size limit for cytology in the two groups. It means that the ATA in thyroids practically does not, so the thyroids of the ET practically does not affect it uh, regarding the indication of cytology of suspicious characteristics. The presence of any of these suspicious characteristics absolutely does not influence the indication of aspiration cytology. And this is unique. This approach is unique among thyroid systems, and I will return to this problem. So, I will follow with the next part of the presentation, but I ask you whether you have any questions or comments regarding this part of the today event. I open my chat, so if uh, somebody has problems with the microphone, can make question in chat. Comments? Any issues regarding this part? It is quite a tough material, uh, but we have two topics, the nodular echogenicity and the internodular echogenic figures, which clearly emerges from other topics of thyroid ultrasound, so uh, it, uh, it is worth uh, spending uh, enough time to be internalized uh, these issues and uh, to uh, deal with enough details. So, questions, comments? Tamás, what would you recommend for us? Which thyroid system to use in everyday life? Uh, in Europe, uh, I mean... Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, we know uh, well each other, Eve, so I do not use thyroid systems. I'm not a great yeah, fan of this. Uh, I think that uh, originally the thyroid was invented in order to compare the results of different authors, and it is uh, very good for this. Uh, 
I think that uh, there is uh, no significant difference between the systems. I spent the past four years partly uh, managing uh, uh, international study regarding the usefulness of sirets. So I, I, I'm very familiar with this topic. I don't think that any one uh, is better than the other. Uh, naturally, it is uh, it can be used, and and it is quite an objection. Uh, seems to be an objection that we have to use tyrants. Uh, I, I I think that in Europe we can use the European tyrants. Uh, but uh, much more interesting is uh, the different approaches. There are occasionally subtle, occasionally very important differences between uh, the logic behind the tyrants. And uh, if we are familiar. Uh, with these differences, uh, uh, it uh, would uh, cause great advantage for us. So, I have, have you ever, ever, have you ever re have you, uh, re have you evaluated your opinion in comparison to the new tyrant system? I mean, if you see um, um, an audio, uh, which is suspicious, and it would be. Um, for example, are you Tyrus three? And in your opinion, in your opinion, it would be a a very suspicious one. So I I think that you decide on your opinion. But what would you recommend if somebody see only a only a radiology report uh, telling you that it's a you Tyrus four or a you Tyrus three? But we don't recommend you to make an FNA. So would you recommend for us to? Um, to examine the patients ourselves again after the radiology report and decide ourselves what to do or uh, just let the radiologist suggesting something to you or accept the radiology report. No, I, That's I, an everyday life um, um, basically problem nowadays because we are we are handling a lot of um, uh, a lot of radiology report uh, telling us not to do an FNA, and if you see the nodule, you would uh, go for an FNA. So that um, it's really conflicting some sometimes. Yes, I agree with you. If uh, I I think that uh, uh, in this webinar and this course uh, are almost exclusively endocrinologists or resident mm -hmm. endocrinologists, uh, so uh, it would be not a nice thing. Uh, uh, to <clears throat> tell uh, wrong things about uh, the radiologic approach, but I think that similarly to the cardiology and gy gynecology, uh, it would be better if all endocrinologists uh, can be master ultrasound. It is not a real conflict, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. our approaches uh, would be significantly changed, and occasionally uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, our approach can be uh, in some cases uh, better uh, than that of the radiologist. Uh, naturally, there are many radiologists who are excellent in this topic, but mm -hmm. I guess that an average radiologist has less chance giving correct diagnosis than an, every, uh, than an average endocrinologist who learned ultrasound. Uh, we have the opportunity to take the clinical data, the part patient data in, uh, into account. We have a special expertise. So mm -hmm. uh, exactly, uh, or uh, being more uh, uh, straightforward, uh, in my everyday practice, uh, I uh, face with many cases uh, in which uh, backward figures or cometary artifacts are overjudged as microclassifications. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay. regarding to the today topic, uh, this is one of the greatest issue. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, with the radiological report, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it it uh, does not matter whether we uh, not we are the better uh, ultrasonographer. If uh, I uh, meet a patient uh, who was uh, in a radiological unit in an excellent radiological unit, I uh, manage and I uh, perform the ultrasound by myself because it can help. Uh, uh, can affect uh, my approach regarding the management of the special uh, patient. So it it not uh, only uh, the revision, uh, but mm -hmm. my decision uh, will be influenced if I personally perform the ultrasound and not only read the ultrasound report. Mm -hmm. 
we have okay. three or four cases uh, for questions in um, <laughs> in chat. In chat, uh, the first was that uh, I wonder why the FNA indication is same for AT targets, highly suspicious and suspicious modules. Uh, okay, you wonder, and I wonder also, but this is the situation. Uh, I think that uh, this is backed by a, a very uh, old uh, approach. Before uh, the guidelines have evolved, before 2006, uh, our main uh, guide was the echogenicity of the module. So in the ancient time, we had to perform cytology from all nodules. Later, we restricted the indication of cytology to hypochaic modules. And I think that uh, there are many hypochaic modules which are which has no suspicious characteristics and are less than 15 millimeters in diameters, which can be cancers. The issue is whether uh, the performance of cytology in a nodule between 10 and 15 millimeters, which is hypochaic but lacks suspicious characteristics, uh, is a, a forward looking approach, or we have to spare cytology. The ATA and the European Target Association are on different uh, uh, opinion. I don't think that uh, one or the other has right and the other is wrong, but this is the situation. As does you ever biopsy any nodule which is less than one centimeter was the second question. Uh, I think it is not uh, the today topic, uh, but uh, I, I will answer the question. I think that uh, we have no universal uh, rules. All target systems state that a nodule which is between 5 and 10 mm in maximum diameter but belongs to targets 5, the most suspicious category, we should and can consider cytology. Above 1 cm we must perform uh, cytology. I think that the situation depends uh, on many factors, including the age of the patient, including the location of the nodule. So, for example, a uh, uh, 6 mm nodule in the central part of the thyroid, not attached uh, to the edge of the thyroid, so uh, in cases when extrathyroidal spread can be excluded, uh, my approach is different compared with a similar uh, nodule which is uh, located in the ventral or dorsal surface uh, of uh, the thyroid. Uh, and we have to take into account another uh, important fact, uh, the psyche of the patient. So, uh, I am quite fully convinced that uh, a nodule less than one centimeter, if it would be a papillary cancer, cannot cause harm. Naturally, there are exceptions, but these exceptions uh, are not good if uh, uh, guide us. So less than 1%, really less than 1% of thyroid microcancers, it means that thyroid papillary cancers less than 1 cm in diameter can cause harm of the patient. And if such patients are regularly followed up, then we will reveal uh, the cancer in uh, a good uh, situation. So if uh, the nodule increases from 6 mm to 11 cm, we will perform the cytology. But it is uh, not a universal uh, role, uh, rule. Some patients are afraid of uh, uh, harboring cancer, some are not, so uh, it, it depends, I think, uh, uh, on the patient psyche also. Should a pathologist request a thyroid classification from the clinician? Mm, I cannot answer this question. Uh, I don't think that the pathologist uh, opinion is influenced by the thyroid classification. Uh, the pathologist uh, must be informed uh, if the patient was treated thyrostatics or if the patient underwent on radioiodine therapy because these can cause uh, great influence, great impact 
on the presentation of uh, thyroid cells and uh, occasionally also on thyroid structures. But I don't think that any other uh, clinical data uh, would be important uh, for a pathologist. Other questions? If not, I follow with the content. Uh, yes. So, now let's turn to the differentiation of echogenic spots. As I mentioned, beside microcalcifications, cometal artifacts and backwell cystic figures can appear as echogenic spots smaller than 1 mm in maximum diameter. This figure demonstrates the difficulties of interpretation. As we can see, according to the literature data, the inter-observer agreement among experienced investigators is moderate regarding in, uh, microcalcifications. See this range from 0 0.5 to 0 0.68. But these studies were based on comparison of preselected ultrasound images. A recent study performed on analysis of ultrasound videos which represent the real-world situation much better, proved a much lower agreement. This 0.27 kappa value corresponds to a poor level of agreement. So, when discussing the cases, we should not forget about these data. On the one hand, this is warning to you that what I am saying is not the objective reality, but a subjective interpretation, because there is no such things, sorry, no such thing as a good answer or a bad answer in a disturbingly large proportion. On the other hand, this also means that the task is not only to try to interpret the patterns correctly, but also to do with the many ambiguous cases. So we have two duties. First, we have to try to differentiate echogenic spots. Second, we have to deal with those cases when this differentiation was impossible. So let's see two examples. So the issue is the interpretation of this module and this echogenic figure. What is this? I think it is quite simple. Yes, absolutely agree. This is a typical form of an isolated microcalcification within the thyroid. Uh, lobe. Let's see a second example. So this is So what is this? What's this? What is this form of... What kind of echogenic figure or figures does this mm -hmm. lesion has? This? Dream classification. Okay, so the form of my macro or course classification is the rim classification. I, I can agree with you. 
but I slow down the video. So here at that part, this is coarse calcification, but when I move with the transducer in another direction, yes, here, please focus on that isolated granules. So here is a coarsely calcified focus. But several millimeters in a distance of several millimeters from this macro classification, we can see other kinds. Here and there. Macro classification and other kinds of spots. So in my opinion, in this case, the presence of macro or coarse or rim calcification is evident, but we have to deal with the possibility that this nodule can contain also micro calcifications. So I play once more with normal speed from the beginning so by scanning this lesion it is evident uh, the presence of coarse calcification based on the acoustic shadowing uh, for example here but if we analyze on enlargement or more thoroughly then we have to suspect that this lesion contains also micro calcifications. So these forms one, two, three. Clearly, coarsely calcified focus, here is the acoustic shadowing, but be aware that not dorsal to the entire hyperopic figure can we see this uh, acoustic shadowing. So this raises doubts whether this entire figure would be macro calcification. I think this is not a uh, simple case, that's why I present in the advanced course. But this is quite a suspicious module. Are you agree with me? Please do not hesitate. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, try to. But is the final diagnosis? Uh, final diagnosis was benign, uh, oh, okay. benign, uh, mm -hmm. but this is really quite a disturbing pattern. Try to memorize for a few seconds this pattern. So the acoustic shadowing is very tiny and there are echogenic spots. And I play once more the previous simple case. Acoustic shadowing doors are to the entire macro classification. So this is quite a different situation. Please, uh, uh, somebody had comment, please. Uh, in the previous case, uh, is there any back wall figures? Previous case, not that. Back wall, is no, I, 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 I play once more. I don't think so. so back wall of the nodile. No, uh, no, 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 uh, no. Lines. no. What is it? The lines, uh, these lines are present, maybe here is, uh, but uh, be aware, here is again a similarly not very bright line. 
this belongs to the normal uh, connective tissue That's backbone. Mm -hmm. So these these uh, 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 we frequently <laughs> overlook. Yes, here maybe here is a cystic area within this uh, lobe here, a tiny cystic area. It can be uh, backward figure, but as I mentioned previously, the presence of backward figure does not influence uh, the malignancy rate. Yes. Uh, maybe. Uh, uh, I don't think that this is the real issue in this case. Maybe it can has, for example, there an echogenic line, but uh, we yes. have to focus on this part, on the ventral part of the lesion. Yes, I wondered that. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, in case of um, macro calcification, do you call uh, a nodule every time? Because you cannot see because of the acoustic shadow if it's a nodule really or is it in the tissue of the thyroid? It can be or not? Yes, isolated microcalcifications can appear uh, within a thyroid nodule. Uh, uh, so without a uh, nodule, maybe it was formerly a nodule and uh, went on degenerative process and remained coarsely classified focus, um, so isolated microclassifications without pathological module can appear in thyroid. Okay, thank you. Okay, I ask you for one So the lesson of these two cases was the Doro analysis of ultrasound patterns. Usually an experienced investigator does not devote too much time to judge a pattern and does not use enlargement in the decision process, but occasionally, as in the cases presented, a correct decision requires much more time and the use of enlarged view. Let's see the next examples. This table presents four spots of four different cases. We have minimal, if any, clues to decide which kind of echogenic figures to these spots belong. If we take not only in the spot, but a larger part of the lesion into account, the decision becomes much easier. The two left cases present not only granules, but also lines. So here was the granule, and there was the granule, but here we can see also lines, here and there. So this should not cause great concern. However, the right lower nodule has a concerning pattern, not only because of the echogenic spots, but also due to the irregular borders. Not in this view, sorry. The real issue is the left upper case. This has echogenic lines, but echogenic granules clearly prevail. So, sorry, I made a mistake. So, these were in the that magnification. Synchronous presence of lines and granules in these two cases, but in the right two cases, uh, we had no blue even at a larger uh, field of vision. If we take the entire nodule into account, then this is a quite reassuring pattern. These are backward figures. Here arises some doubts, but I left these cases, leave this case at the final discussion. In this case, echogenic granules prevail that almost all of them are located dorsal to tiny cystic areas, so these should not be regarded as clear forms of microcalcifications. These are very likely backward figures. This lesion, which proved to be papillary cancer, has microcalcifications. So this irregular, not this regular shape of the nodule is a very important argument in decision. And these irregular lobulated margins in that module uh, has influence on our judgment on the echogenic figures.
I tried to go forward yes so if in that case in the left case the presentation of the other rope that one here in the small insert a bit decreases our anxiety in the judgment of this pattern although it would be an unusual situation that a papillary cancer occupied the entire right lobe and the great part of the left lobe the other opportunity that granules would prevail over lines to such an extent as signs of a proliferation of connective tissue would be also a rare finding so these two cases we can reassure the patient in that case it is evident that we have to deal with uh, the possibility of papillary cancer but even the doro analysis of the contralateral lobe was not of great help in that case okay cytology uh, disclosed hashimoto's thyroiditis but in contrast the other with the other uh, two uh, other three cases this case remained concerning so taking all in all we started with single echogenic spots no clue how to interpret these granules but when we took the environment into account, we could decide in two cases that the spots within are unlikely microclassification in that and this case. The presentation of the entire pattern stood for microclassifications in the right lower nodule. In my opinion, the left upper nodule remained unclear. I play a video from the PowerPoint. What's this? I cannot see the chat this time, so if someone has any opinion or comment, please say it. So what's this? The stereo sky. Phenomena. Yes, I agree with you. So this is a typical presentation of starry sky phenomenon. Multiple small hyperocular granules. And be aware, it is very difficult uh, to determine the edges of the nodule. It is very difficult where this nodule starts and where it ends. So not only microclassifications, but also the entire presentation of the nodule is very disturbing and suspicious. And it proved to be a papillary cancer. Another example. Do you perform an FNA in this situation or do you send the patient immediately okay. to... So, so back to the case, no, no, no we have to perform FNA. Uh, I will present not such a convincing case, but not far from this case, which proved to be Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So we have to perform cytology uh, from such nodules. Sorry. Other questions to this papillary cancer case? Naturally, if the patient refuses cytology, uh, we have to send to surgery without cytological report in such case, but fortunately not much patients uh, refuse cytology. So I go forward with the next case. It is indeed not one, but two cases. So here is that module. And this is another.
So, uh, try to focus not only the figures but the presentation of the entire nodule on the regular borders of that case and on the irregular borders of this malignant case. Regular borders, irregular, not well-defined borders. Naturally, uh, such granules are ambiguous, but this is very likely a comatilla artifact, so we have not one but more clues. But if we face with that pattern, uh, we have summed up whether this can or cannot be microcalcifications. So the spots itself are not fully decisive. If we take the entire presentation of the lesion into account, or the lesions into account, uh, this is two different stories. So this is the benign. And that is the malignant module here. So these are very likely comatil artifacts uh, here, that one. If you focus on this figure and that one, this is two different figures. The ventra and the dorsa, so this is should not be mixed up with cometal artifact that figure or that complex figure. A cometal artifact uh, is a single uh, form, yeah, single one. Comments to this case or cases. Are you here? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. No comments, no questions regarding these cases. So one more consideration. Here at where I stopped, tiny cystic area, tiny cystic area within papillary cancer, it is quite a frequent finding. So papillary cancer is uh, can be difficult uh, to judge uh, and uh, because uh, it frequently has cystic areas undergoes on cystic degeneration you can see many tiny cystic areas so we can see here also I guess backward figures as well but the this quite large but less than once and one millimeter large uh, spots many of them are very likely microclassifications so our second and perhaps the most important tool in the differentiation of echogenic figures is the taking the pattern of the entire nodule into account we move forward with two more cases So, how to judge this discrete lesion? What is your opinion regarding this lesion? What kind of echogenic figures does it have? No one wish to comment this case. Uh, it is 
very suspicious for me. Yeah, I agree. Mm. I agree with you. Although uh, it has background figures clearly, but these echogenic granules are really disturbing. I don't think that we can uh, uh, clearly state that these are microclassifications, but we cannot exclude this possibility. Here is the lesion within the echogenic figures. And I present a very similar other case. So here's the lesion. So there are some important differences uh, comparing the two cases. But this time I will emphasize the role of the environment, the broader environment. In the previous case, uh, hyperfigures were exclusively within the region in the previous case, but here we can see uh, similar echogenic spots and lines outside this discrete lesion. Uh, this pattern uh, is a Hashimoto's case, and uh, the echogenic lines and granules within the discrete lesion and outside the discrete lesion are very likely presentations of connective tissue, proliferation of connective tissue or fibrosis. So here the lesion, but outside the lesion we can see many other forms of echogenic lines and granules outside the lesion. I go back to the previous case. In this case, almost exclusively within the lesions are granules. Okay, the connective tissue background or backbone can see as were anywhere within the thyroid, but it is a normal finding. Such bright granules are almost exclusively within this lesion. Uh, so this is really a concerning pattern. While that one is much, much less concerning because such granules are found as were in the thyroid, not only within this region. Was it quite clear? Okay. So these two cases prove that occasionally not only the presentation of the nodule matters, but we must consider the broader environment into account to a more justified decision. I move forward with the next case. So please focus on that module. So okay, this is a cystic lesion, but that part of the module can cause Concern. Okay, here we can see tiny cystic areas, but at first sight this nodule is not very 
calm, uh, calming, has not a very calming pattern. It is a but uh, this fluid moving in, in it. Yes. It's 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 it, it, or just refilling, just refilling. Just refilling. So wow. uh, uh, the fluid tampon has tamponaded uh, the vessel, and after removing the fluid, this tamponade has disappeared, and the uh, wow. module refilled at once. Okay, Oof. this is. So, uh, how to interpret uh, these figures within this nodule? There are multiple figures. Yes. Uh, I put my question in another way. Can we exclude microclassifications and no. or... Okay, uh, uh, third, third, kind of, third kind of question. Can we exclude malignancy? No. Okay, I guess that the Koreans would not agree with you because we can find some typical forms of cometary artifacts. Yeah, the cystic part is very large. But here, it is a very typical form of reverberating artifact. These lines, these tiny lines, doors are to this figure. These are proofs of a uh, cometary artifact. Here, mm -hmm. focus on that module. That, uh, not module, that uh, granule. Here. So the Korean state, okay, the only society which states that the presence of a single cometary artifacts exclude malignancy. And as I mentioned, I had serious doubt, doubt uh, regarding this uh, uh, consideration, but I analyzed almost 500 uh, malignant cases, uh, videos of 500 malignant cases, and I could not find even a single uh, typical cometary artifact. Here, I guess, mm -hmm. here is another one. Okay, it is mm -hmm. very difficult. Uh, I'm convinced because I uh, uh, analyzed uh, hundreds of malignant cases uh, and you have to uh, uh, trust me and trust to another uh, man, even of an expert is difficult if we have no uh, personal experience, but I guess that the presence of a single cometary artifact should calm us down. The real importance uh, will be emphasized at the last part of the webinar. Here, I guess, I gave the solution. Yes, this, this is this, the typical, the sa uh, same. Uh, okay. So here, focus on that part. Solving the puzzle. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that that. So this is a single typical form. In many mm -hmm. other cases, we can uh, raise the possibility, but this is a very typical form. Okay. So I, I uh, will not uh, <clears throat> force you uh, to convince me. Uh, I only uh, ask you uh, to realize that this is a cometary artifact. So this pattern. And this is not within fluid, this is uh, between two cystic chambers. And there are other parts of the nodule which can have uh, cometary artifacts, but this part uh, is clearly, uh, this figure is clearly a cometary artifact. Okay. Uh, for me, the distribution of the uh, granules are not uh, balanced, so they are not uh, the same. Mm. Okay, I agree with you. So, I mean, so, it is suspicious for me, the whole pattern. Okay, uh, I, I uh, remind you that uh, the diagnosis of microclassification is a matter of exclu ex exclusion. And if you see, <clears throat> there are many lines. So, I can accept if someone has doubts, 
and even I have doubt whether these all of these uh, figures are not microclassifications, but uh, it would be very uh, bad if we state that this nodule clearly has or this nodule has obvious forms of microclassifications. So these can be suspicious, agree, uh, but these are not uh, those forms. So if we have other explanations, see this line, maybe line or granule, I don't know, uh, here is a line, uh, there is a line, so uh, equally bright lines can be found. And the most of these figures are partly related, so see this, that one, here is clearly a very tiny anechoic spot ventral to this uh, echogenic granule, here is a quite a bit larger anechoic spot. Mm. So it is not, not a simple to answer uh, case. Uh, and I think that uh, aspiration cytology uh, has to be performed. Okay, uh, this video uh, presents uh, the removal of cystic content, but I performed aspiration cytology from the white solid part uh, of the lesion. Uh, this patient underwent on surgery and uh, surgery proved to be proved uh, benign adenoma. Uh, uh, mm. Other comments to this quite difficult case? If not, I play the next. Maybe you should look the chat. Go, go back to the previous case. Uh, you should look the chat. Okay, I. So what 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 is the question or the problem? Would not be be better uh, if we prioritize the storage parts. Prioritize. Uh, uh, sorry, if I don't understand. No, I just uh, I I just saw in the chat that would would that uh, the uh, the question was would not it be better if we prioritize the solid part instead of other cystic part of with less tyrosite. Uh, prioritize. Uh, what does it question. mean? Prioritize. Uh, uh, so it is a mix. Oh, no. Uh, prioritized of the FNA. I, I think yes, okay. Oh, okay. You want yes. the uh, FNA, the, the cystic part, but yeah. the solid part. Yeah. Yes, uh, I agree. And you, as I mentioned, uh, I serve from cytology from the uh, solid part. This video does not uh, show uh, this uh, uh, part of uh, ultrasound guided aspiration of the solid part, only shows uh, the removal of the cystic fluid. But thereafter, I uh, performed aspiration so, uh, cytology from the solid part. So. Okay, sorry, I didn't understand the question. Agree. So we have to perform as patient cytology in this case from the solid part as well. But before performing aspiration cytology from the solid part, it is worse to remove the cystic content because it increases the efficacy of the cytology. In this case, it had no effect because the cyst automatically refilled. Now go forward with the next case. Quite a similar situation. Not to solve, what is the opinion? The question is similar to the previous case. Can this module be malignant? Does this oh, module yes. has cometal artifact? Not solving. There is a cometal also. Please? Uh, but, uh, there are a uh, couple of cometals. Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, I agree. So this, uh, some of the figures are uh, not obvious. And there are some ambiguous forms. But uh, I try to show a single form 
with this multi-layer dorsal presentation. It, it is not so evident compared to the previous case, but I guess that uh, this uh, figure can be had as uh, a collateral artifact. And there are other uh, uh, not fully obvious forms, for example, here at that part, and maybe also that. <clears throat> so this is not uh, as convincing for me as the previous case. So I don't think that this solved our problem, uh, but uh, this uh, favor that uh, these uh, granules are not microclassifications. Naturally, any doubt perform aspiration cytology. And here is the next case. So issue, the issue is the same as in the former two cases. This nodule is moderately hypocritic, uh, was close to taller than wide shape in the previous transverse section, and had intranodular echogenic figures. The question is, can we find a typical form of cometal artifact or not? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 So yes, I agree. So if you if we accept mm -hmm. the approach of the Koreans, which was not uh uh for Tzafol, how is it English? So there were no, please. So there were no publications which was which uh, which were on other opinion regarding the significance of cometary artifacts. So if we uh, accept the current approach, uh, mm -hmm. then uh, we have a very important tool. So there are many, many uh, typical, quite typical forms of cometary artifacts in this case. Okay, I go back to the relevant part. So here I go back. Please focus on that uh, figure. So this is a typical cometary artifact. And also, I guess that this can be had, and there are some others. So at first sight, this is a very suspicious nodule uh, because of the not uh, quite regular borders and the possible uh, taller white shape. And also, uh, at first sight, uh, uh, the granules clearly prevail over lines. So the issue is not. Uh, the great presence of backward figures, but the issue is whether these figures are cometary artifacts or can be microclassifications. And I go back to a previous part of the presentation. A real cometary artifact must be a psammoma body of a papillary cancer. So, in this case, not only the obvious forms, but also the uh, concerning the ambiguous forms are sh or should be held as cometary artifacts. So the lesson of this case, uh, how a cometary artifact can present within solid parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Comments, questions to this case? Gosh, in Europe, which is the most um, important sign um, 
for papillary thyroid cancer, the hypohygienicity, the taller than white shape, or the content of microclassifications, or everything together. Okay, uh, I remind you, uh, in one of our gynecological presentations of the university, in the first, uh, the professor said that the only uh, absolutely sure sign of pregnancy is the birth. <clears throat> Do you remember? Okay. okay. So, so uh, I, I don't think that we can diagnose papillary cancer except for very rare cases. I presented uh, one case of um, uh, starry sky phenomenon. Uh -huh. uh, this is uh, the most impressive uh, uh, sign. But I guess that 100% and 0% is the attribute of God. Uh, we can see, we can say, we can uh, tell 99%. 50 shades of grey. Please? We have uh, to judge the 50 shades of grey. Oh, okay, <laughs> maybe. So, yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, our decision on ultrasound uh, is not, not very convincing. Neither in cytology. Occasionally in mm -hmm. cytology, okay, uh, cytology has a 1% chance of false positive rate. So, if a cytologist mm -hmm. states that this is clearly a malignant lesion, uh, one person chance that uh, a cytologist uh, had a wrong diagnosis. Mm -hmm. No. I go forward with the presentation or try to go forward. So, I mentioned consideration the broader environment and the role of cometal artifacts. So I guess that uh, we have uh, these four uh, viewpoints. Uh, by using these tools, we can make clear decision about the origin of an epigenic figure, but not infrequently uh, we can judge only a probability. In those cases, when microclassification cannot be excluded, aspiration cytology is the solution. If we think about all this with a cool head, we can very easily get the impression that what this effort is actually about, which is what today's presentation and the discussion of the characteristics of the nodules are about. I guess that it is a real question. Does really matter if we occasionally perform aspiration cytology? So should we make a clear distinction, a great effort uh, to clarify some echogenic spots or granules? I think that it is a real question and the answer is not a unisolo yes. I think that it does not really matter. But what really matters is the following. After the evolution process, the cytology is inconclusive in 20 to 35% of cases. Bethesda 1, 3 and 4 categories belong to these cases. So the cytology can be non-diagnostic, can belong to Bethesda 3, atypia or follicular lesion of unknown significance category and can be a follicular tumor. Another problem that aspiration cytology does not reveal around 5 to 10 percent of cancers. This is the accepted false negative rate of thyroid cytology. The more important one in is this. So every fifth to every third of cases, after we uh, went through the entire evaluation process, we have no clear-cut answer. And we are faced with that question, to operate or not to operate a patient. And in contrast with the previous situation, performing unnecessarily FN in 10% of cases, which does not matter, this really matters. And what is our help? Our help 
is the reconsideration of the ultrasound pattern. So I guess that the entire course is not about uh, to decide whether to perform aspiration cytology or not. Uh, it is a secondary uh, importance uh, how to judge regarding the tyrets. The real issue arises in this 20 to 35 percent of cases when we have no clear answers even after the cytology and we have to go back and reconsider the ultrasound pattern and this what really matter and in this respect uh, it would be better if we can good make a good analysis of echogenic figures and regarding the today event we have one and a single property, this is the cometary artifact, which can significantly increase the chance of benign uh, lesion. All other characteristics, if present, uh, push our decision towards malignancy. So regarding echogenic figures, there are two kinds of figures which are very important in the decision of these 20 to 35% of cases the presence of microclassification and the presence of cometary artifacts. And that's why it is important uh, to, to realize and to correctly judge as much as possible uh, cases, uh, the echogenic figures. And one more final consideration regarding this thought. Uh, I'm not aware of great number of publications which uh, handle the ultrasound characteristics after the evaluation process. All guidelines pretend as if uh, the role of ultrasound would be restricted to select patients for aspiration cytology, but no one guidelines accept the role of ultrasound after the evaluation process. So the guidelines pretend as if we would live in an ideal world and after the evaluation process we get clear answers in most if not all cases. But the real situation is absolutely not that one. In one fifth to one third of all cases we need other tool because we get did not get a clear answer and in this respect, the ultrasound is clearly emerges from other uh, features, clinical or laboratory data. Questions? I have two or three final cases and I present This one. So this case illustrates my final thought. The cytologists were very clumsy, was very clumsy. It was me. I tried to gain adequate material three times from this lesion, but I failed to gain adequate material. So the cytology was three times uh, non-diagnostic. But I think that the situation was not very difficult. So clearly within the lesion, here was the tip of the needle. So I hit the nodule, but I failed to get enough material for cytology. But what is this? Microclassification. Yes. yes. So I, I think that uh, this was not a great task to state that this nodule is very likely a papillary cancer. Not only microclassifications, but uh, the irregular uh, borders. So I sent this patient uh, to surgery uh, despite negative cytology, despite that uh, this nodule did not increase the whole thyroid, so there were no other causes 
uh, of surgical indication except for the ultrasound of the suspicion based on ultrasound findings. So this illustrates not a different case, a difficult case, but again, be aware, you read the ultrasound report that the nodule has microcalcifications. You are faced with three times negative cytology. Compare this situation to that if you not only read, but also see this pattern. So I guess that uh, you will be much more convinced what to do if you personally see this ultrasound pattern and not only read that one. So final cytology, uh, final cytology, final histopathology disclosed papillary cancer. Forward with another case. I ask Eva Chaibok not to comment this case because it was our a common patient, Eva sent this patient to me for aspiration cytology. What is your opinion regarding this thyroid lobe? Hmm? Comments? Thyroiditis. Yes, uh, the patient clearly had thyroiditis. It was a hypothyroid patient. Uh, but how to interpret that part? Extruded uh, extension. Please. Extruded extension um, of the classifications. Um, so uh, first, first, uh, these uh, I, I cannot interpret otherwise. These almost exclusive granular. Uh, presentation, then these are microclassifications. On the ultrasound diagnosis, it, it fulfills the criteria of microclassifications. We cannot see or only very uh, small number of lines. So mm. this, I, I cannot interpret otherwise. And if uh, we consider this pattern uh, as microclassification, it is very close to the starry sky phenomenon. And again, it is very similar to the previous case. Uh, the lesion has no clear borders. In this case, the cytology resulted in Hashimoto's thyroiditis, but despite the negative cytology, uh, I suggested surgery. And it turned out that we have to be modest. Histopathology did not find cancer. So these two cases are very similar. Uh, and maybe in the second time I would send this patient again to surgeon. And not, uh, not a, in, so it is also an important sign which somebody mentioned that if it is a papillary cancer, it is very close to the ventral border. Uh, we could not exclude, we cannot exclude the possibility of extra extension in such case if it turns to be malignant. But it turned to be benign Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So we have to be modest, we have to take risks, but occasionally we fail. Uh, may I comment on this uh, please, case a, a little bit, uh, Tomás, because please. She was pregnant during that time you performed the FNA, and it revealed uh, or a suspicion for papillary thyroid cancer, but she was operated on the thyroid after delivery. So probably the pregnancy influences the cytological pattern of the whole thyroid. So you never know because everything is changing uh, during, uh, during pregnancy. Um, so that um, uh, your first cytology um, uh, was um, suspicious for papillary thyroid cancer, but she was operated on a thyroid um, one year after delivery. So there were a lot of uh, uh, lot of uh, time gap between the two. Yes, but not, not so the start probably of the pregnancy can influence these yes. situations. But uh, I uh, yeah. saw very little uh, number of uh, suspicious signs. 
My final idol this was mainly based on this ultrasound pattern. And uh, um, you sent uh, this patient twice to me before uh, the <laughs> surgery, after the delivery, I, I guess nine months after, and the pattern mm -hmm. was the same. So maybe same the pattern. cytological pattern uh, was influenced by the pregnancy, but not the ultrasound pattern. And this yeah. pattern was so alarming that I, I, I suggested uh, 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 surgery and maybe if I met another patient with a similar pattern, I would make the same mistake. Yeah. So it is, it is very, very difficult uh, uh, not to be uh, concerned uh, facing this uh, uh, pattern. Mm. Okay, and I have a final case of the same team. First, wrong setting, resolution instead of penetrance, and we cannot see the nodule. I lowered the frequency and we can see a better image. So this patient had a history. Uh, I performed cytology from this patient uh, who was sent to me by Gabor Kovac, who is our speakers uh, of this course, and cytology resulted in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But the nodule was much, much smaller. 18 months after the first cytological uh, examination, uh, the nodule has grown by more than two and uh, five point times in volume. The second cytology again resulted in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But together with uh, Gabor Kovac, we decided uh, to send this patient to surgery and histopathology disclosed vartin-like papillary cancer. Uh, there are several uh, lessons of this case. Regarding uh, the final histopathology, the vartin-like tumor of the thyroid, vartin-like uh, papillary cancer is a very rare disease and uh, is, is uh, characterized by islets of malignant cells within uh, lymphoid background. So it is quite difficult uh, to gain adequate material uh, from uh, the 10 or 20 percent of the tumor which really contains malignant cells. The second uh, lesson that Cytology is very good if a nodule is located in the ventral part of a lobe, but if a nodule is located dorsal, then if when the needle crosses the non-nodular thyroid, maybe that we gain material only from that part. I remind you that there is a technique which is called non-aspiration cytology, when a needle is sticked into the nodule and no aspirations are performed and while we stick the nodule uh, we can gain material and if it obliterates the needle then we can make aspirations but we can gain cells only from that part of the nodule which uh, the needle first crossed. Uh, it is clear that the uh, efficiency, the diagnostic accuracy of thyroid cytology is worse in nodules which are located uh, dorsally compared with nodules which are located in the ventral part. So the specific diagnosis, vartin-like tumor, uh, is a difficult task to gain adequate material. Second, uh, it was a dorsally located nodule when uh, aspiration cytology more frequently fails. But regarding to the today topic, the issue is that this nodule has increased rapidly. It contains microcalcifications, it has a bit irregular borders, not very much, but a bit irregular borders, so occasionally we can uh, send the patient to surgery on the ultrasound presentation and on the follow-up results despite the negative cytology. So we had three cases, or I had three cases. The first proved that in the event of uh, non-diagnostic cytology, the ultrasound pattern can decide 
that the patient has to send to surgery. The second uh, case uh, proved that we have the limitations. We are not gods. We can never be 100% sure uh, what is a lesion uh, which has very suspicious uh, presentation. And here is a third case, which in contrast with the previous one, uh, proved that it has capacity uh, uh, decision made on ultrasound presentation and clinical presentation despite a negative cytology. So we have many, many questions and uh, much less answers. But this is our task to deal with this situation. Questions, comments to this last case or to the entire webinar? Uh, I would like to ask a question. Are the Vartin-like tumors more aggressive than classic papillary thyroid carcinoma? Uh, there are very limited uh, experience with Vartin-like tumor. I had uh, two cases in my practice. Uh, in um, cellular glands, I uh, guess that uh, the prognosis is uh, highly depends on the age of the patient. In the thyroid, we have very limited experience uh, with this Wartenite tumor, but I guess that the, based on these few cases, uh, it is not held as a very aggressive tumor. More aggressive than the conventional form of papillary cancer, but uh, it uh, remains within the limits of the thyroid uh, well differentiate cancer uh, aggressivity, so the patient has very good prognosis, a bit worse than in conventional type papillary cancer, but not, uh, not a bad prognosis. Thank you. Uh, Tomas, may I have a question? Um, not, not about this topic, but have you ever seen a patient having uh, on, in, in one, one thyroid lobe a papillary thyroid cancer and in the other lobe a follicular one? So two different types of thyroid cancer in two in, in in the two lobes. I got a patient now mm -hmm. having this final histopathology, but um, I have never seen that type before him. So it's okay. I try to find the case. Uh, have you have you ever got somebody having that type of yeah. mixture of everything? Yeah, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. I try to Is find my sure case. I also had one case. Really? So it is not so rare. Okay. My patient was 34 years old, a male, and he had uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma, follicular variant, uh, infiltrative uh, uh, cancer, and uh, non-invasive follicular variant of papillary cancer. So he had four types of cancer in one thyroid. <laughs> On a background of Hashimoto's thyroid. Uh, he is a male too, Did he? 34 years old. So the same situation. It's a typical papillary thyroid cancer and the follicular one. So the, Okay, do, uh, do you see this an, uh, uh, case 401? Uh, yeah. Yes. yes. So there is a papillary cancer in the right lobe here. Uh -huh. And a medullary cancer in the left lobe. Oh, yeah. So this is a typical okay. form of amyloid deposit, uh, uh -huh. uh, isoechoic or echonormal patches, and it contains uh -huh. some echogenic spots. And I have also the video. Uh, but this is a papillary and a medullary. Papillary and medullary right? cancer. So not papillary and follicular, and papillary and okay. medullary cancer. So here okay. is the right with microcalcification, uh -huh. the left lobe with amyloid deposit. I, I guess that I had uh, one other case, but no uh, uh, video recording of this. When mm -hmm. I started with my uh, cytological practice, uh, there was mm -hmm. one more case. Uh, mm -hmm. But this this uh, is hmm. uh, that one. So it is worse. Uh, reminding mm -hmm. this pattern of amyloid deposit, this mm -hmm. quite oh, specific, okay. quite characteristic, mm -hmm. this one. Irregularly 
isoequity mm -hmm. or echonormal shape, which has some echogenic spots, seemingly microclassifications, but indeed uh, medullary cancer does not have microclassifications. And here is the aspiration cytology of the papillary cancer focus in the uh, right lobe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other comments, Thank you. questions? If not, thank you for uh, your presentation. It was an exhausting uh, webinar, uh, but I guess that this is one of the most important topics uh, in the thyroid, uh, together with the nodule echogenicity. Final question, possibility, opportunity. If not, Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, the recorded Thank version you. will be presented Thank by you. Sunday. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.